This is episode 25 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, I talk about the incredible life of Jermaine the Wizard. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode 25. In the news department, a big reminder to everybody that the uh, Potter and Potter auction will take place this coming weekend, June 29th, 2019. This is part two of the Jim Rollins auction, and there are some really incredible pieces in this auction. Uh, if you're not already signed up, just go to potterauctions.com to find out more information about signing up and bidding online. Or if you are in the Chicago area, I believe you can attend the auction live. Uh, best to contact them first, however. Uh, there is a wonderful documentary that can be viewed for free on YouTube right now called Always Amazing, the true story of the life, death, and return of the amazing Jonathan. And it is, uh, it's a little over an hour. There are interviews with David Copperfield and Penn Jillette. They also interview Jonathan, uh, Penny Wiggins, Erica Van Lee, Joel Osborne, and others. It's, it's a, um, it's very eye-opening, and frankly, I, I found it to be a very touching story, and uh, I recommend it highly. I also want to remind you that the Magic Detective podcast can be heard on multiple platforms, including iTunes, Apple Podcasts, Spotify in the podcast section, iHeartRadio in the podcast section, Stitcher, Google Play, and there's some others that I've forgotten about. Also, uh, some folks who are new to this whole podcast thing, uh, I'm going to give you a couple tips. If you're going to listen to the podcast, one of the best ways to do it is while you're driving from place to place. If you're going uh, driving to work or uh, a leisurely drive or something, it's a great, if you can hook your mobile device, your phone, uh, into your car stereo. It's a great way. It's kind of like, you know, radio basically, but it's over the internet. It's a great way to listen there. Um, often when I'm exercising, I'll listen to podcasts. So that's a, another way you can listen to them. And uh, if you're wondering, yes, I listen to my own podcast. Um, by the time I've uploaded, it, I've actually listened to it three times. That's usually just to make sure there are no bugs in the podcast. And then uh, I'll wait a few days and listen to it again with fresh ears just to make sure that it's, you know, what I had intended. And uh, you can access podcasts via mobile devices like your phones, iPads and tablets, and of course, over the internet. So that's just a little beginner's course there in podcasting. Today, I'm going to talk about one of my favorite magicians of all time. And I became fascinated with this guy. Uh, I think first the first time I saw one of his posters in a, in a book that came out in the 70s called The Magic Catalog, and I forget exactly who put it out, but there was a black and white image of one of his uh, iconic posters. And then on a trip to the American Museum of Magic, I actually saw this poster and I was awestruck. The poster was tall. It was a big three sheet poster with an image of, uh, of a black cat and a witch leaning over a fire. And the smoke from the fire revealed an image of Germain, who himself was conjuring a spirit. And across the top of the poster were the words, Germain the Wizard. And I, afterwards, I read everything I could find on Germain in books, but there wasn't a whole lot back then. Uh, I did find out that there were two books written about Germain specifically, but by this time they were long out of print. And I was finally able to uh, get a hold of a copy of both of them, and I read them cover to cover, and wow, Germain just, after reading them, he just seemed like a real wizard. And so when you listen to this podcast today, if you don't know anything about Jermaine, I think you will leave believing that Jermaine was a real wizard as well. So sit back, listen, and enjoy. Oh, and also really quickly, it may come as a surprise to many of you that Carl Jermaine would not approve of this particular episode. He was very much against people writing or talking about him after his death. In fact, he even was against people writing about him after he retired and he was still alive. He told Stuart Kramer he would come back and haunt him if he dared write about him after his death. And then Stuart wrote two books, The Secrets of Carl Germain in 1962 and Germain the Wizard and His Ledger Domain in 1966. 
Our subject was born Charles Matt Mueller on February 12, 1878 in Cleveland, Ohio. Technically, he should be Charles Matt Mueller Jr., as his father was also Charles Matt Mueller. David Price's book, Magic, A Pictorial History of Conjurers in the Theater, explains the name Carl came about during his school years when several other boys in his class also had the name Charles. The teacher decided that Charles would be called Carl, and it must have pleased him because he kept that name throughout the rest of his life. Carl became interested in magic in his youth, but I'm not exactly sure the specific event, what it was that you know piqued his curiosity. I have a feeling, though, that his interest in magic came directly from his father, who had seen magicians in his native Germany and often told young Carl about the feats he had witnessed. Also, I know that Carl had a copy of Modern Magic by Professor Hoffman, which was given to him by his father when he was 14. At age 15, in 1893, he sketched out a design for a possible poster inside his copy of Modern Magic, on a blank page, no doubt. His name in the design is listed as Chaz Matt Mueller. The following year, he would create another sketch for a potential advertising piece, but this time his name was listed as Carl Matt Mueller, Magician. Young Carl's early magic career, in fact, his entire magic career, would be a family affair. Census records from the time list his father as being a machinist and also working in the picture framing business. He was clearly a skilled craftsman. Carl's father would make many of the props that Carl would use in his show. Another family member would be a regular part of Carl's show as well. That was his sister, Ida. She would act as an assistant and would participate in his mind-reading experiments. And I'll have more on both of them later. Carl would have several stage names before settling upon the best one. First, of course, he was Charles Matt Mueller, then Carl Matt Mueller. Then for a time, he went by the stage name Alexander, but upon being selected to perform for the Central Lyceum Bureau, he chose the stage name Germain. And actually, the name he chose was Germain without an E at the end, but due to an error by a printing company, he became Germain with an E at the end. Uh, They didn't have spell check back then, unfortunately. Now, before I can go into his magic, I I have to point out uh, something I read in several different articles and books on Germain. When describing his act, many people use the word artistic. Uh, The first time I read this was in David Price's book, and then I also saw it again in the Annals of Conjuring book. In several uh, magazine articles on Germain, they also use the word artistic to describe him. And on the surface, it might seem that these various magic authors are simply being lazy and copying each other, which happens a lot in magic literature. But, But having looked over the material in Germain's show and seen photos of the incredible props, plus having seen a number of them in person... I can attest to the fact that artistic is probably the perfect word to describe Carl Germain. Now, beyond the look of his props, why do so many say Germain was artistic? Well, I truly believe it was because he was highly creative. He presented many of his own original creations. When he did regular magic routines, he always added something to the routine to make them unique to him. His pattern was different from the standard performer of the time. Of course, he dressed immaculately, as did his onstage assistants. And this appears to be the case from the very start of his career right up until the end. Jermaine's bread and butter seems to be the Lyceum and Chautauqua circuits, as I mentioned earlier. He continued in those throughout his entire career. In the book Jermaine the Wizard and His Ledger Domain by Stuart Kramer, he shares the story of an event that took place in July of, uh, I believe it was 1899. The Germain Company was on board a train heading for their next destination. They were part of a larger troupe of performers. Germain was there with his sister Ida. Unknown to the passengers, a cargo train off in the distance was on the same track as the passenger train. No one knew, and the sudden realization did not prevent a disaster from happening. The two trains collided, sending various cars crashing and some tipping off the tracks. The passenger car that Jermaine and his fellow performers were on was further down the line but still suffered from the impact. The result was that their car came to an abrupt stop and tilted at an angle off the tracks. No one was seriously hurt, though everyone was very shaken up. After helping the other passengers out of the wrecked cars, Jermaine realized it would be impossible for him to make his show unless 
he made other arrangements. And I'm not even sure how he pulled this off, uh, how they were able to get a buggy to take them and their luggage and equipment to another train. Uh, and he booked passage on another train and made it to their destination. They were about a half hour late in starting, but they were able to give their performance. Another story from the Jermaine the Wizard book tells of Jermaine's appearance at the Opera House in Wheeling, West Virginia. The company was unaware that the entire area had flooded, but the organizers met Jermaine at the train station in a raft to bring him to the theater to do the show. That is crazy. If you're wondering what kind of magic Jermaine did, he was capable of doing most anything. He primarily did stage and platform style tricks, but he always kept a number of very deceptive close-up tricks on him at all times. He also excelled at mentalism, which included his sister Ida. And one of the bigger surprises for me was to discover that Jermaine also presented illusion magic, as in, you know, grand illusion. And at this period of time, grand illusion was really in its infancy, but there were some really truly marvelous creations that came out of this time period. One early illusion from Jermaine was called the Mystery of Malabar. Now, the thinking behind this routine was brilliant. The effect was a two-sided platform that was set up in front of the audience. A top went onto this two-sided platform, and then a basket that was similar in style to that of the famed Hindu basket effect was placed on top of the little platform. You could see above, you could see below, you could see to the sides of this platform. Next, Germain put on a robe, a mask, and a beard and climbed into the basket. And only seconds later, walking down the aisle in the audience was Carl Germain. He had vanished from the basket and in an impossible time appeared at the back of the theater. Now, he wouldn't be the first or the last to present this type of effect, but his method was very, very clever. Each year, Jermaine added new amazing mysteries to his show. And I'm going to take a, a couple minutes and talk about some of these. The block. This is an incredible effect with a crazy method, but completely original. From the perspective of the audience, this is what they see. There's a block of wood, probably about 12 inches long and maybe two and a half inches square. This is handed out for examination. In addition, there's a wooden board, which is 16 inches long, 12 inches wide, and it's about a quarter inch thick, which is also given out for inspection. Jermaine would then take them back and he would hold the block against the board and somehow, mysteriously, it passed right through the board. He then pulled it back out and placed the block in a different position at a different angle, pushed, and it went through again. Finally, he repeated it a third time. Now, to the audience, it appeared he could push the block through any spot, and it would pass through like a knife going through butter. Now, the image of Jermaine passing the block through the board is just crazy crazy cool. In its most basic form, this is just a penetration effect, uh, and there are many of those in magic. What makes this one so diabolical is the fact that the items are handed out beforehand, and also their appearance is, is quite organic, meaning they don't look like magic props, but rather normal pieces of just scrap wood. They also don't appear to leave a hole in the board once the block is passed through. It's just wild. Now, keep in mind, I don't reveal secrets on this podcast, but uh, trust me, the method is really crazy. And also, in the book uh, Conjuring Anthology by Jim Steinmeier, he has two effects of his own creation that are inspired by the Germain block trick. So if you're interested in that kind of effect, I encourage you to check out that book and check out the, uh, the two routines in there. Another incredible Germain effect is his butterfly mystery. Again, this is one of the early uh, Germain photos that just really had me intrigued. Now, keep in mind, this is totally original. And here's the effect. Germain would tell the audience he was about to produce a somethingness out of nothingness. And then with bare hands, he, he'd reach up in the air and produce a 14-inch silk. He would do this again and again, and again, and again, until he had about a dozen silks of varying colors. And all, by the way, all this was done with to patter. This was not done to music. It was talking. The dozen scarves were then rolled into sort of a cocoon, and suddenly 
this bundle of fabric sprung open to reveal a very large butterfly with fluttering wings. I don't know the actual size of the butterfly, but in images it looks to be, I would guess, about three feet wide. It's very large. Once it's produced, it's handed off to an assistant who carries it away. It's just... Oh, it's just an amazing piece of magic. Just so beautiful. Just out of the ordinary from your typical silk effects, I would say. Flowers have figured prominently in the acts of many magicians. The Keller flower growth is a wonderful routine where two planters of dirt eventually sprout two large bushes of flowers. Keller's routine used several tables and two large metal cones, which were first shown empty. And I mentioned it before, there is actually a video online of the Keller flower growth being performed. One interesting little thing, that version of the Keller flower growth uses an improvement suggested by Carl Germain. Just a little bit of trivia there. Now, Germain's personal favorite routine out of everything he did was his own flower growth. This was the creation of Carl and his father. And you see, according to the book Germain the Wizard by Stuart Kramer, Carl's father had seen a magician in Germany do a similar trick, and it always stuck in his brain. So now, father and son went about creating a version of their own. In fact, Germain would do several different flower productions before working on the actual flower growth idea. It went through various renditions until the final version, the ultimate one, was finally realized. This is how it appeared to the audience. On stage sits a gold Louis XIV style side table. It's away from the curtain. It has a clear view underneath and above the table. On a second table sits an empty flower pot. Germain shows the empty flower pot and proceeds to fill it with dirt. He then carries the now full flower pot over to the other table and he sets it down. He picks up a fan that was resting on the table and without covering anything, no tubes, no curtains, Germain simply waves the fan in the, in the direction of the flower pot and almost immediately a small, tiny sprout, green sprout, is seen. Jermaine then continues to wave the fan and move around or kind of dance around the table, and gradually the tiny sprout blooms and gets larger. As Jermaine continues his little fan dance, the plant grows higher and higher until the audience sees large roses coming from this plant. The plant grows to a height of several feet. Jermaine then takes a pair of shears and cuts off some of the roses at their stems and passes them out to members of the audience, thus proving he has just made a live rose bush grow right before their very eyes. Now, I've been very fortunate to see the Jermaine flower growth prop live in person. It resides in the collection of Ken Klosterman, and it is a thing of beauty. The elder Matt Mueller handmade this table with ornate carvings of angels on each of the uh, table legs. The method was diabolical. There was nothing like it when it came out. Many have said it was superior to uh, Keller's flower growth, at least that's what I've read in a couple books. I, I swear there's a video of it being presented online, but I, I try as I might, I haven't been able to find it. Um, there are three germain flower growths that exist today one as i mentioned is ken klosterman's collection there's another just like it that's in the collection of david copperfield and then there's a third earlier version of the flower growth that's in the collection of teller earlier i mentioned ida matt Mueller. this was carl's younger sister she was born in 1880 and she was two years younger than carl she provided the music in the show by playing the piano and served as an assistant to carl since his earliest days as a magician. In one of his first tours in 1899, she's actually listed on the brochure along with her photograph as Ida Germain. She's also singled out as helping him in his telepathy act. She continued in this role until Carl was offered the chance to perform in England. And in June 1906, Germain set sail for England. He arrived seven days later after an awful sea voyage which left him seasick the entire time, but he recovered quick enough and was soon performing. He would tour all over England and Ireland. Eventually, he ended up in London, where he appeared at the New Bedford Palace Theatre. Germain was very popular in London. 
as was magic in general. Many of the greats of that era were in town the same time as Germain, folks like Chung Ling Su, Houdini, Lafayette, and more. In 1907, Houdini and Carl Germain were both in England. Germain happened to run into Houdini at a banquet and decided he wanted to amaze his friend. He then proceeded to present his favorite pocket trick. Uh, the term pocket trick was what they used back then. Now we would call it close-up magic. The trick was called the spirit writing on a cigarette paper. And the effect was a blank piece of paper was pinned to the end of a pencil. The spectator, Houdini in this case, was asked to name someone and the signature of that person appeared on the previously blank paper. Houdini watched like a hawk, but in the end was amazed by the presentation. The highlight of Germain's time abroad was working at St. George's Hall for Masculine and Devant. He was there for quite a long run. By December of 1907, he was back home in Cleveland after another long, seasick-filled ocean voyage. On February 26, 1908, Germain's friend Edward Morrow passed away from typhoid fever. You can learn all about Morrow by listening to podcast episode 11. Morrow's real name was Walter Truman Best, and his wife, Allie, was abruptly left a widow. Germain did not find out about the death until after Best had been buried. Allie Best asked Germain for help in dispersing her husband's show props. Germain agreed and headed north to Maranook on the shores of Lake Leelanau in Michigan. Maranook, by the way, was the name of the mansion that they built there. While going through the various props, Germain naturally got first dibs on the things he wanted. He came away with Morrow's meteoric ribbon effect, and he came away with a very famous piece that had once belonged to Charles Bertram, and he almost came away with Allie Best. Apparently that relationship, however, did not last, but let me backtrack to the Charles Bertram item. This was Bertram's spirit lock that no one knows how it ended up with Morrow, but here it is in Morrow's collection. Germain had apparently tried to purchase it while he was in England a few years before, but was unable, and now, now it was his. And as was his custom, he created a very special routine for the spirit lock. He told the story of Dr. Faust, who was in prison, and this lock held the prison door shut. He held up a picture of a lock and then held his fingers as if they were a key, and a shadow was cast onto the picture by his fingers, and as the shadow entered the lock, the picture on the lock, he turned his hand and the real lock sprang open. And thanks to an article in the December 2005 issue of Magic Magazine by Tim Moore, he said no one knew what Bertram's routine was, nor did they know what Morrow's routine was. So here was Germain making this clever trick his own by creating a mystical and memorable story. Curiously, at the conclusion of his tour in 1909, Germain gave what he called his farewell performance at Martinkus Theater in New York City. A farewell performance? It seems rather abrupt and a bit premature, to say the least. However, in only a few months, an event would happen to make him want to leave the stage for good. On January 30th, 1910, Ida Matt Mueller died from a tumor on her spine. She had been in declining health ever since he returned from England a few years before, but now her death left a void in his life. He began to reassess his priorities. The lure of the road and stardom no longer appealed to him. The reality of the road was that it could be brutal and miserable more than it was good. And as far as stardom, despite the constant demand for his shows, he had not achieved the kind of celebrity status like Keller, Herman, or even Houdini. It was time to look for a new profession, something that would keep him home near his father, who was still alive, and near his friends and familiar surroundings. He was able to convince the president of the Western Reserve Law School to allow him to attend classes despite not having graduated high school nor ever attending college. What would happen to the show, you might ask? Well, Germain trained a new person to be Germain. Paul Fleming, who was an up-and-coming magician, was chosen to take out the show and fill the many dates that were already booked. He would hit the road as Paul Germain. On the rare occasion Paul was unable to fill a date, Germain himself went out and presented it. He was not completely out of the magic world, but he was heading in that direction. In 1914, Carl Germain became a lawyer and opened a practice in Cleveland. He dealt with probate law and had a partner in his practice. He intended to be out of magic at this point and leave the performing to Paul Fleming. But for whatever reason, Germain couldn't leave magic alone. 
By 1916, he accepted an, another Chautauqua tour. This one, however, would prove to be his final tour. During the two-month tour, he was having issues with headaches and blurriness in his vision. He went to see a specialist who recommended he go to Boston to see yet another specialist. The verdict was a tumor, a brain tumor, pressing against the optic nerve. An operation was necessary or else he could go blind and probably even mad. But the operation, well, the operation could also cause him to go blind. Jermaine decided to go ahead with the operation, and when it was completed... He had zero vision. It turned out to be temporary to a point, but he never regained his full vision. This predicament also caused him to have to leave the law firm that he had recently started, and it also put an end to his show business career. His father would assist Carl for the remainder of his life, at least until his father died in the 1940s. And I'm not sure of the date of this, but there's a story that comes from Jermaine the Wizard by Stuart Kramer. In the story... Houdini was in Cleveland performing and contacted Jermaine about some curtains he had for sale. So I'm assuming this is towards the time when Jermaine was retiring from business. Um, Houdini and, and Jermaine worked out an agreeable price, but before setting the deal, Houdini said he needed to see them hanging in the theater to get a better idea of their condition. Um, well, the curtains were hung and Houdini went on with his show. And after the show, Jermaine was waiting for him, and Houdini said he'd be happy to take the curtains, but the offer was now half what they had agreed upon. And Jermaine vanished for a bit, and when Houdini went to look for him, uh, he had departed along with his curtains. The curtains eventually found their way in Paul Fleming's show, and today they hang in the mini theater in Ken Klosterman's collection. And I'm assuming these are the plush green curtains that are there in, the, uh, in Ken's place. Though for some reason I was thinking... When I read this story, they were the black curtains that hung in Jermaine's show, but that's just me being thinking too much. In 1922, Jermaine decided to put together a talk lecture on spiritualism. This was something he'd been interested in his entire life. In fact, in many of his shows, he featured a spirit cabinet, different versions of that, and other spirit effects as well. It was a perfect topic for Jermaine to talk on, but a tour never developed. And it, it could have been that he no longer had the, the name recognition like, you know, like Houdini had. Um, plus, it could have been his partial blindness was very apparent. So um, I can imagine that figured into people's decisions not to go with the program as well. This remarkable man, who created so much original magic, had been dealt a terrible blow with this partial blindness, but things would get even worse. In 1938, while crossing an intersection, a truck ran into him. He survived the accident, but after the accident, he was left completely blind. There was one saving grace, however, and that would come in the form of a young amateur magician who befriended Carl Germain. His name was Stuart Kramer. If it had not been for Kramer, the final days of Germain would, would have been much, much worse. And if it had not been for Kramer, we would likely know very little about Germain other than what was, you know, what was written in magic magazines, which is very sparse. As it was, Stuart Kramer was with Germain in the hospital in his final days and in his final moments on this planet. Carl Germain, Matt Mueller died on August 9th, 1959. He's buried in the Riverside Cemetery in Cleveland, Ohio. He was 81 when he died, and he lived with his blindness for 43 years, more years than he was a full-time magician. A sad ending for such an incredible performer. I was surprised by one thing. The Matt Mueller family plot has four Matt Mueller's buried there. That wasn't a surprise. On Germain's grave, it has this on the tombstone, Carl Germain Matt Mueller. But on his father's grave, it has Carl Matt Mueller as well. However, in census records, he's always listed as Charles. And I can't help but wonder now if his name might actually have been Carl, as this is a, a German name, and it was changed when he immigrated to the United States. It also stands to reason why his son Charles continued to use Carl throughout his life. But now it also makes me wonder about this schoolhouse story and whether or not that's true. Hmm. 
Now, like his friend Edward Morrow, Germain's posters did not include devilish imps, which were kind of standard for the time. Instead, much like Morrow, he had mythical creatures like elves and fairies and witches and the like on his posters. It appears that Germain had one full-color lithograph, and it must have been printed sometime between 1899 and 1905, as the poster has the spelling of his name, G-E-R-M-A-I-N-E. His other posters all have a red-black color scheme. Uh, I think one of them has a red-black-white color scheme. And they're all very striking posters. And I'm not sure, but the long poster with Jermaine conjuring the spirit, I've seen this poster in a reddish color, a yellowish color, as well as an orange color. So I'm not sure what the original color was or is, um, or if there were actually uh, several versions using different colors. I don't know. Also, Stuart Kramer reveals in his book that a stash of posters was found in the attic of Germain's home after he died, and these included one sheet, two sheets, three sheets, and eight-sheet posters. And I've never seen one of these eight-sheet posters, so I can only imagine uh, what that was like. A final point I'd like to make about Germain. I believe Germain may have given the very first TED Talk. Now, if you don't know what a TED Talk is, I suggest you look it up on Google. On May 9th, 1949, Germain spoke before SAM Assembly 10. He was at the home of magician John Gardena. And unknown to Germain, Gardena made an audio recording of the presentation. So Germain's trust had been betrayed, and when he later found out, he was livid. But for posterity's sake, that recording still exists, and thankfully so. Now, I've not heard the recording, but in the May 2002 issue of Genie magazine, a transcript of that speech is featured. It's a bit heavy, and frankly, for an audience, probably even boring. But if you read the content, you, you really should be enriched. The, the point of the talk was that to be a true artist, you must be original. And to be original, you must be yourself. So to present a trick word for word, move for move, is not art, but copying. And, and please, please, I know there have been countless debates on this very subject. But I'm talking about Jermaine's opinion here. So... Um, I, I, and I think Jermaine has the moral high ground when it comes to talking about originality. So uh, his point was not to change everything in a given routine, but to include yourself, your personality, your thoughts, your opinions in the routines. A great example of this would be uh, Jermaine taking a standard trick and adding himself um, like, for example, in The Miser's Dream. Now, if you're not familiar with The Miser's Dream, you should listen to podcast number 23 about T. Nelson Downs, the man who revolutionized that trick. But suffice to say, many people perform The Miser's Dream in much the same way. Jermaine added something that I just love. It's the conclusion of his routine. After having pulled countless coins from the air and from other places, he turns all the coins into candy. And the method can be found in the Stuart Kramer book. It's genius, and it's really rather simple. Another example would be Jermaine's approach to the Keller flower growth. He never presented this trick, but he recognized it could be stronger with one simple change. In Harry Keller's hands, this routine was a thing of pure beauty. And now how it looked with other people did it, I don't know. But Jermaine suggested changing the table drapes to a mesh-like fabric. In this way, the audience could actually see through them. And proof of the brilliance of this one simple change can be seen in the Nicholas Knight performance on YouTube uh, of Keller's Flower Growth. It's the one that I keep talking about. I, I wish I had the ability to include Jermaine's recorded speech here on the podcast. Ugh. Maybe in the future I can track down a copy and get permission from whoever the owner is. I'd love to hear Jermaine speak of originality in his own voice. That would be so, so cool. Now, I wonder how many magicians in the past hundred years have had this similar approach that Jermaine has. And off the top of my head, I'd say Slidini, Tommy Wonder, at least for pure originality. And as far as putting them themselves into the magic, one only has to look as far as the top performers in the field, like Henning, Copperfield, Siegfried and Roy, Penn and Teller. And then there are a lot of others, but the point is those performers were unique, and they were unique because they were themselves. Well, I hope you've enjoyed this little journey into the life of Carl Germain. I have to mention a few people that are important to the overall podcast 
Ken Klosterman, Tim Moore, David Copperfield, Teller, Todd Carr, Stuart Kramer, Torkova, David Ben, and everyone who over time has helped to keep the name and the magic of Carl Germain alive. I didn't talk to any of these people about the podcast, but I have come across uh, their writings and some videos and thoughts on Jermaine. So they helped really help me to, uh, to shape this podcast. Oh, and slightly off topic, there is something I want to mention about the Magic Detective podcast. I'm now at 25 episodes, and I'm sure if you've listened to all of them, you can see how they've improved since the first one. Uh, when I first started the podcast, I really had little clue on what to do. I kind of jumped in with both feet and decided, you know, let's see where it goes. I knew I'd figure it out as I went along. Uh, one of my initial thoughts was to do interviews. And you'll notice that 25 episodes in, there has not been a single interview. And part of the reason for that is I've noticed that almost all the magic podcasts that I enjoy are interview shows. And I didn't want this to be the same as those. Uh, that's not to say there won't be interviews down the road, but I think it, when there are interviews, there'll be special episodes rather than the normal episode. I also don't expect to, uh, to include interview during the first season at all, which is still a few months. I still have a few months to go on that. Um, I do have a huge list of people that I would like to interview. So I can imagine season two will feature a few interviews at any rate. I do thank you for listening to the podcast. If you like the podcast, please consider giving it five stars on iTunes and a nice review. Uh, that is, if you're listening on iTunes. If you're listening on a different platform, there, there are various ways you can leave a comment or rate the program, and I sure would appreciate it if you would do that. Positive comments and likes help the rankings among all the other podcasts, so the more I get, the better. Once again, I thank you for listening to the Magic Detective Podcast. My name is Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective. Have a great week.